Excited uh, to be here and talk in this series known for. Everybody say known for. known for. You're known for something. You're known for something. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's uh, athletic ability, if it's artistic ability, your creativity. I don't know if it's your business, your family, your kids. I don't know if you're known by the experience that were good or bad. Maybe trauma has defined your life. I don't know what you're known for, but you're known for something. And today, what, what I want to talk about is being known for the main thing that, as Christ followers, we're called to be known for, and that is loving God and loving people. That we love God with all of our, our hearts, with our actions, with our, our beliefs, and that we love people. And this series specifically in this season is an example or an opportunity for us to show that love by our actions. We say all the time at Action Church, you can, you can give to something without loving something, but you can't love something without, without giving to it. That as Christians, our life should be marked by our generosity. For God so loved the world that he gave. As Christians, we should be giving of our thoughts, of our hearts, of our time, and specifically our resources to the only thing that God is building and, and returning for. And I want to talk about a story today in Scripture that I think correlates to the season that Heights Church is in. I've been around Heights Church from before the beginning, been thinking about you, praying for you, uh, doing whatever I can to help Pastor Josh support the same way he does for Action Church and really building our churches together. And I really feel that we're in a season here at, at Heights Church, and I use we because I love you and believe in you and and want to be a part, as big a part as we can of this place. I really believe we are in a season of multiplication. I really believe that God has been preparing for almost a decade for what's going to happen now. Not that he hasn't done amazing things, because there's hundreds of stories just in this room. Testimonies of his faithfulness, of his power, of experience you've had with him. But I believe it's all been a, a foundation laid for this next decade, this next season. A season of multiplication. And so... As I was praying about our time together, the passage I want to talk about today is actually found in all four Gospels. Today, we're going to camp out first in John's Gospel. We're going to reference all four Gospels and talk about when Jesus fed the 15 or so thousand people, the 5,000 men right off the Sea of Galilee. We see him feeding these people, and it's probably, of magnitude-wise, the largest miracle and why I want to talk about it today is Jesus was the main character of the miracle, as he always is. But there's some unique supporting cast members in this one. And I really feel like we find ourselves in this story because God is a miraculous God. Jesus is always at the center. But I, I love this one, especially for this time in this place of this church, because I believe you and I have a, a supporting role to play in this season. John's Gospel, chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, After this, <clears throat> Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with the disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked him, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? Look at verse 6. He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. I feel like that's what this season is about. It's a test for you and for me of what are we going to do. Jesus already knew what he was going to do in this passage. He already knew that he had the recipes for a miracle. He already knew what the Father was going to lead him to do. And I'm telling you, in your situation, whether it be personal, professional, or in the, the congregation here at Heights Church, Jesus already knows what he's going to do. The question is, are we going to be a part of what he's going to do? And there's oftentimes a test of our faith of our obedience, uh, uh, of our hearts to allow us to show that we are ready to be a part of what God is doing. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Jesus is asking spiritual questions. Philip is responding with 
earthly and practical answers. Oftentimes God is doing something way bigger than what we actually see that he's doing. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Again, earthly solutions. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled the 12 baskets and scraps left uh, by the people that had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. When, we, when I read Bible stories, sometimes I, I read them and I already, <coughs> I already know the end. Especially when miracles happen, you kind of read it kind of in a deductive way. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they did this and they did that. And, and then this happened and cool story. And then we move on to our next daily reading, our next devotion, our next passage. But if you really put yourself in this story here today and we kind of make it make more sense to our modern time. Jesus is, is on a platform and he's preaching. And he's been preaching all day, the Bible says. And, and Matthew and Mark's gospel talks about how late it's getting in the afternoon. Like this service started this morning when we all gathered at the 830 service. We've been here for like four hours, by the way. If you're new to this church, we've been doing this all morning. And it would be like if I started preaching at the 830 and I'm still up here at this service still going with the same message. So like how many of you know I would have run out of stuff to say and you would have stopped listening? You know what I mean? Jesus has been preaching all day and the crowds gather and you got to think it's late in the day and nobody came prepared they came for one service not a series you know what I mean like he's been preaching all day and they're like we thought this was a morning service we had lunch plans come on little bottomless mimosas little brunch for the for the girls we got all sorts of things happening this afternoon Jesus still preaching and the disciples the disciples are back here side stage and they're like man how do we get Jesus to stop preaching? Like, it's good, but like, seriously, bro. Like, we've been, you've been telling, it's good, but like, you still go. And like, yeah, I got keys are played. They've sent the keys out seven times trying to close out the service. Jesus just shushing the keys guy. I'm still in the middle of this thing. They're like, I got it. Peter and John, they're like, Ben, we ha- we, we, we've got to fix this. I'm hungry. You're hungry. People are hungry. So they send out poor Philip and Andrew. Because they're like, I'm not going to to talk to Jesus. Like, he's preaching. So Philip and Andrew go out like, Jesus, hey, we got a problem. But they express it like most church people express it. It's not their problem. It's somebody else's problem. Come on, you ever been there before? Like, hey, the, the people, the people are hungry, Jesus. Now, we're not hungry. We do not feed on bread alone. But you are the bread of life. And so... Just want you to know, spiritually speaking, and just I'm just content. I've been back. I got my notes. I'd love to talk to you about them later. I got all the notes from all the, all the sermons you did today, all the great sermons that you've done today. We're good, but the, the people are hungry, and they're thinking, "Oh, well, Jesus is going to shut this down." Now that the people are hungry, He loves the Jesus loves the people, and so He's going to shut this down. We'll start back tomorrow. Well, Jesus turns to Andrew and Philip and says, "You feed them." They didn't expect that answer. You just see like Philip and and Andrew kind of going back to Peter and John and being like, it didn't work. Like he said for us to feed him. They're like, did you tell him we don't have anything? So they they go out and scurry. They finally find the kid with the two fish and the the five loaves. And they they kind of bring that back. And they're like, Jesus, we got to send him home. This is all they got. He's like, he he takes it. He blesses it. He breaks it. He's like, go go give it to the people. And they're like, "Uh, still Still really not a lot here. He's like, yeah, I did what I was going to do. Now you go do what you need to do. And then we see the miracle multiply, expand, and we see 15,000 or so people receive this miracle and see the goodness, the glory, the power of God. It's also, as I was reading this, putting it in kind of modern day, do you realize that, that, that Jesus could not do this miracle? Now, I am not limiting God. I'm limiting you. Uh, Jesus could not do this miracle in 2023. There are too many dietary restrictions. There are so many people that would complain about this miracle. I'm a vegetarian. I'm a vegan. I don't want to kill the fish. Is, this, is, is the bread gluten-free? 
Because if it has gluten in it, I don't care if you bless it or not, Lord. You cannot bless gluten in this body. You don't, you don't know what gluten does to me. I'm hungry, but I'm not that hungry. And about this fish, can we really have a conversation about the fish? Is it farm-raised or lying caught? I need to know where this is sourced from. Is this locally sourced? Is this a sustainable source? Where is it sourced? And if it's tilapia, I don't want anything to do with it because that's not even a fish. We see, we see this miracle happen here. And I want to unpack today Jesus at the center of the miracle, but all of the supporting cast members, because I believe that God is calling all of us, me included, and this local body of Christ at Heights Church to be a part of the multiplication miracle that he wants to do. The first thing that we need to get in our part, Jesus got his part. First thing we need to get is we need to make sure that the order is correct. Write down the order is important. If we're going to be a part of the miracle, if we're going to be a part of the multiplication, the order, the order, the order is important. In all four Gospels, we see this order that what they had, the little boy collected by Philip and Andrew, what we see is that it was given to Jesus, it was blessed, it was broken, reorganized, reconfigured, and then it was distributed. But the order was important. Without it being given to Jesus, it couldn't be blessed. And without the blessing, there is no supernatural anointing on it. So therefore, the distribution doesn't matter if it's not blessed. Once it's distributed, now it can be fulfilled, enjoyed, it can accomplish its purpose. The order is important. You don't want to get things out of order. Come on, you don't put your clothes on out of order. That'd be weird. You don't watch shows out of order. If you're watching shows with a friend and they get ahead of you, you're going to be offended. They're like, oh, no, just catch up, just skip a couple. No, the order is important. We can't watch things out of order. We're watching the Marvel movies in chronological order at my house with my boys right now, and I've seen some of them. I'm trying to get Bentley to skip some because I don't know about you, but some of them are better than others. And he's like, Dad, I can't skip because the order is important. I need to tell you today when it comes to the things of God and being a part of the miracles that God wants you and I to be a part of, the order is important, that he wants our, our trust and our heart before he wants what we can do with him and for him. The order is important. So it's not just if you serve, if you give, if you're a part of it, it's when you do it. It's the first thing. We don't ask God to bless something at the end. We give him our trust at the beginning. My question to you at this last service of the day is, do you trust God with everything and do you Trust him with the first of everything. Do you trust him with the little bit, or do you just wait till you have a lot? The boy didn't wait till he had enough to feed 5,000. He didn't wait until he had built a business, a restaurant business, a chain, and waited till he had enough for everybody. He said, I don't, I don't really know what you're going to do with this, Lord, but I'm giving you access to it. And that's the posture that, that God wants from us. Like, we don't have to know the end results. And I think so many times we want to know what's going to happen on the other side of our generosity, on the other side of our sacrifice, on the other side of our serve. And he's saying, I don't, I don't need you to understand the destination. I just need you to understand the start of this thing, which is trust. The order is important. It's important. We can't wait for seasons of plenty to be generous Generosity is decision in advance to give. It's not based on circumstances. The order is important. Second thing, write this down. Obedience is important. <clears throat> obedience is important. Didn't, didn't get a lot of amens all day on obedience because in 2023, we don't like obedience. We like opinions. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need. <laughs> it's quiet. I get it. I like mine, too. I don't think that's right. I, I, I want to do it this way. God doesn't care what you think. God is not asking, hey, I wonder what they're, how they're going to feel about this. The Trinity is not up there saying, hey, we, should we do this or should we take a vote? The kingdom of God is a kingdom. We are submitted to his authority and his will. It's not up for opinions and negotiations or majority votes. What if we took a vote? I don't really like what you're saying, God. What if the disciples like, Jesus, what if we had a better plan for this miracle? He's like, I don't care what your plan is. I am in charge and you are not. Our obedience is important. I love this in verse 10. He, tells, he says, tell everyone to sit down. Notice he doesn't say, hey, could you go ask nicely? If we could just go and, how do you feel about sitting? 
where would you like to sit? How would you like for this to go the rest of the day? No, just tell her, just, all right, fine, guys. I, I hear you. All right, we're going to do something. Just, just, just go tell everybody to sit down. Because there's always a step of obedience required for us to be a part of the miraculous things that God wants us to do. As we talk about generosity, God is not asking us to be obligated to anything. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't need us. He chose and wants to use us. Go back to Philip. He already knew what he was going to do. The test was not in his power. The test was not in his plan. The test was if Philip was going to be a part of it. He's asking, will you obey? In Corinthians, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he talks about giving. And he says, I don't desire. God does not desire for you to give under any obligation or compulsion, but each believer should decide in their own heart what they should give, and we should give cheerfully. What I'm saying is God gives you a command today, which you are commanded to be generous. It's not in this, I'm, I'm sitting with my posture, I'm sitting with my physical body, but, I, but I'm standing in my heart. No, it's something that our heart, our minds, our spirits, our actions will all line up together because God is not calling us to do something out of obligation, he's giving us an opportunity to be a part of what he's doing. We've done a couple of things that I want to read to you this afternoon. You're not fully living out the gospel of Jesus if you're not living generously. You cannot receive everything that we've, been received, we've received as Christ followers and not live a life of generosity. It's just not possible. And you cannot live generously with your own money if you've not returned to God what is already his. It's called the tithe. Like, I'm generous. I do all these things. You're not generous if you're using God's money for your generosity. What I mean by that, until you've returned to the local church and to what God is building, his bride, what he's building, what he's returning for, you say, well, I am generous elsewhere. You can't be generous with money that ain't yours. If you stole my wallet and gave away my money and people thanked you for generosity, they would call you generous. I would call you a thief. So our obedience is, is started with us returning to God what is his, then living a life of generosity. And I'm just here to tell you today, I've never regretted a season of generosity. I've never regretted. I've never said, man, I wish I didn't help those kids. I wish they had less food. What do y'all do here? Uh, uh, one Child Matters, is that what you do? One Child Matters here, you sponsor kids. Man, I just wish we sponsored less. Just wish more kids went hungry. No, I've never, I've never regretted being generous. I've, I've never met an unhappy, generous person. I'm not saying if you're generous, your life's going to be easy, but I'm saying I've never met somebody that lived a life of generosity that regretted it and was miserable. But I've met a bunch of stingy, greedy people that are. And I'm not here today to pressure you to do anything. In fact, the opposite. I think today is an opportunity. And here is the, here is the ask. I'm asking you, in this season, what are you going to be known for? And as you take that to God, I'm asking you to ask God what he would have you to do in this next season. It may be giving to this offering. It may be going to next steps today and being part of the team that, oh, by the way, needs to grow, to, to reach. It may be a part of dreaming about the school. I don't know what it is. I'm not here to say what because that would be obligatory. I'm here to say there's lots of opportunities, and you need to ask God what your part is in it. And I didn't do something that I wasn't willing, I didn't, I'm not asking you to do something that Gabby and I were not willing to do ourselves. In fact, over the past year or so, we've been praying about this very thing to be a part of, of, of Heights Church and, and to be a part of, of what God is doing here through the giving uh, to, to this, this project. And uh, so we started praying about it. Is anybody like me, you, you, sometimes you pray to God and like you, you, kinda, you want the answer that you're praying for? Oh, you're all holy in here today. Oh, no, I just, I just trust God with everything. Okay, well, then you come preach the message. <laughs> no, I, I prayed, and I was like, God, we, just, we want to be so generous to our friends, Josh and Crystal, and, and God, just but make it like a small amount that's like big enough for them to be impressed, but like small enough where it doesn't really affect our lives. <laughs> I'd like to show up on the list at Heights Church, but not like the top of the list. Anybody like, I want, yeah, okay, yeah, great. And God began to speak to us, and he said, I want you to give whatever you're given to Action Church, I want you to give to Heights Church this year. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, God. I don't even, 
I don't even go to Heights Church. <laughs> Those people ain't doing nothing for me. I come here once a year, they give me a little laugh, a little hand clap, and then I come back home. Like, ain't a, it's not like a mutual beneficial relationship we have going here. And he said, no, I want, you, I want you to do that. And so we ask God, and, and we're obeying that. And I was also, I was walking yesterday, and this was a surprise to, to Pastor Josh and Crystal and the team. It was actually a surprise to me. So that's what Gabby and I are doing personally, but I was walking the f- new facility uh, yesterday, dreaming and praying and talking about what could be and looking at all the progress and, and the amazing things that God has already done. And we're in a season at Action Church, we're believing for some things. We, we have a location that's portable, actually our second location we ever started. And they have about 1,000 people that are coming to a high school uh, every single week, and we've been believing for a uh, large piece of land for not only a permanent location, very similar to what you're, you're building here, but also for our school uh, as well. And, and we don't have a lot of opportunities right now. And God really convicted us, me last night and Gabby, and we were talking about it, that, that while we're waiting for our season, what if we invested in somebody else's season? So we told Pastor Josh in first service today that Action Church is going to invest $100,000 towards the offering to- for the new building by the end of the year. And it's not an obligation. It's not for that moment right there. It's because we asked and we obeyed. And I wanted to have a lot of fun the last 15 minutes of this service. And so I just gave the church $100,000. We should do more laughing, more clapping, more amening. And so, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Who knew? I would have done it nine years ago if I thought we'd have a little better rapport. It's, it's a church. I get it. My, my kids, I call it goal-oriented parenting. It's really just bribing them to be better. I get it. Third service, you need to be bribed a little bit. And so, little investment, little response. Let's go back to God's word. Proverbs 11. The world of the generous get larger and larger. The world of the city gets smaller and smaller. I'm just asking you to live a life of generosity. And when it comes to opportunities, not obligations, ask God and obey i tell you the same thing I tell my church. If God gives you an answer and a next step, I'll trust that it's from him, and I don't care what it is. Ask God and obey. Obedience is important. Here's the third one. We'll keep this one short because it's really personal to you. Very practical. Organization is important. Order, obedience, organization. Verse 10, tell everyone to sit down. In Luke's gospel, the same part of the story, uh, chapter 9, verse 14, says tell them to sit down, but sit down in groups of 50. Like Jesus knew he was the, the power of the miracle, but there needed to be a plan to execute the miracle. And I need you to know that the organization of a church, of a budget, this building has a budget, this school has a budget, the next season has a plan. The organization is important. God gives us the power. He holds the power, but he gives us the, the ability. And most time our part is a secondary part, but we need a plan. And the organization is important. What I want to ask you today is how is your life organized? Because I I believe there are some people that should legitimately not be a part of of this offering or this season of serving because your, your life is not organized in such a way that you're ready for it. But my challenge to you is don't miss the next opportunity by keep making the same mistakes. And so if you want to be a part of miracles in the future, organize yourself in such a way with your time, with your budget, with your own personal development and healing so that when there is an opportunity, this one or the next one, that you're ready. I got the order. I got the heart. I got the obedience. I got the willingness to work. But make sure your life is set up in such a way that it's organized in such a way that it's grouped in such a way that you can make God and God's house a priority. The organization is important. Here's the last one. Write this down. The ownership is important. Ownership is important. we got to own this thing. Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. We've got to own this thing and then apply it to our life. Remember we were joking earlier, Mark's gospel, Anne and John, Philip and Andrew, they come up and he says, you feed them. There are a lot of times in our life where we're taking things to God and we should take everything to God. But he's like, hey, I've already given you everything you need to accomplish this in your own life. You have the power. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the experience. You have the resources. You have the ingredients for the miracle. You feed them. We got to take ownership of this thing. 
That you and I, we're, we're called co-heirs with Jesus. We are grafted in. There's a spirit of adoption on our life that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. This is our body of Christ. This is our kingdom we're building. This is our family, and therefore there should be some ownership in this thing. you got to own this thing. The difference, the difference in a criticism or a complaint and feedback is the position you are in the family. What I mean by that is oftentimes we come in complaining about something when if we were true owners of it, we wouldn't come in complaining because we're not on the outside looking in complaining about something. We're actually a part of the solution, so we're coming in with feedback to make it, make it better. Now, I know you're not like the disciples, none of you here. I'm talking to people like from my church in Orlando, Heights Church, especially third service. You got this down. But sometimes my church says, hey, God, what are you going to do about it? Or Pastor Josh or Brandon and our team here, what are you going to do about this? What are we going to do about this need? What are we going to do about this, this lag? What are we going to do about this? And I believe if you're a true owner, you want to be a part of the miracle. It's not like, hey, what are y'all going to do about it? It's how can I help? What are we going to do about it? It's a perspective shift, an ownership shift. Another pushback would be, well, what am I going to do? What do I have to offer? I'm not wealthy. I'm not that successful. I'm not gifted in ministry. Come on, you ever just kind of just hate people that are super gifted? No, 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 it's me. Guys, a holy group of people in here. No, I just love everybody and just so grateful for all the gifts in the body of Christ. No, when Pastor Josh gets up here and sings, I hate him. I can't sing. I'd be a way better preacher if I could sing. He's like, oh, lift your hands. And then he sings on key. And I'm like, that's so stupid. <laughs> oh, wow, you have the great anointing. I think sometimes we look at people I mean, we're like, oh, they have all of these things. Of course God would use them. Of, of course they could be ingredients in the miracle. Of course they could. And I'm here to tell you all of us have a part to play. And you're never going to be held accountable with things that you weren't gifted or stewarded with. You're going to be held accountable for what you have been given. And there's an ownership piece in that. That may be a big piece or a small piece, but we are going to be judged in direct proportion to what we've been given. You're not responsible for what you haven't been given, but you are totally responsible for what you have been given. What are you doing with the ingredients for the miracle? I love this story because it's not the main characters we see all throughout the New Testament. It's Philip, it's Andrew, and it's an unnamed little boy. It's not Peter, it's not John, it's not men that wrote most of the New Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's Philip and Andrew. And if you're like me, you had to be reminded that they were even one of the 12 disciples. You know what I mean? Like, like who's Philip? I think I've heard of him before. Andrew. Is that Peter's brother? You know, like, who are these guys? And yet the largest, in terms of magnitude and reach, miracle that Jesus did in the New Testament, the main supporting cast was people nobody's ever heard of before. And that tells me that it, it's not always the, the level of our skills, it's the level of our sacrifice. That we don't have to have it all together, but we have to own our portion. What are you doing with the gifts God gave you? What are you doing with the ingredients for the miracle? The little boy had two fish and five loaves. He had the ingredients for a miracle. He had everything that Jesus needed to be blessed and to be broken and to be distributed. You ever thought about what if he would have eaten the miracle? What if he consumed what was meant to be given, he kept to himself? God, it's not enough. You can't use anything with this. That may be a reason. You've selfishly consumed the miracle that God put in your home, in your life. What are they going to do with it? What's going to happen with it? What about me? What if he'd have given like a fish and a half and two loaves? No, he said, I, all that I have, you have access to. And therefore, he has ingredients to the miracle. We consume it or we allow Jesus to multiply it. You all have something. And I'm just asking you, what, what has caused you to stop using 
whatever God has given you? What has caused you to stop giving, stop serving, stop leading, to shrink back when God is calling you to move forward? It's not if God's going to do the miracle. It's if you and I are going to be in on it. He's going to do it. He's going to finish the building. He's going to build a school. He's going to reach tens of thousands, if not more, hundreds of thousands of people over the next generation in this community. The question is, what will our part be in it? Jesus was going to feed the people that day. The question is, is who was going to be in on it? And I believe we prepare ourselves to be in on it by getting the order correct, getting our actions and our obedience correct, being structured in a way, organized, and then owning, hey, I, I, I got to do this. It's important, it's a priority. It's our responsibility because of the time that we have left and the time that we're living in. There's a powerful verse that we read over so many times, at least I have for years, in Mark 6, verse 35, where it's just a simple phrase. It just says, it's getting late. It's getting late in the day, and so people need to be fed. It's getting late. How many, uh, how many morning people we have in here? Morning people? Not very many. You're at the last service. Come on, be honest. You've already had two meals. <laughs> how many late night people we got in the room? Late night people? Yeah, that makes more sense. How many, how many early morning people are married or close friends with a late night person? Yeah, the opposites attract you. You ever found yourself saying, hey, it's getting late. It's getting late. We got to get out of here. It's getting late. Got to go home. It's getting late. We got to go to bed. It's getting late. Come on, you ever, you ever told your kids, it's getting late. You got to go to bed. Come on, daylight savings time, best, best friend to a parent of little kids. You can have dinner at 4.30 in bed by 5.45. They're like, it doesn't feel like it's dark outside. It's getting late. It's getting late. It's getting late. You ever been friends with or married to around somebody that's always late for something? You're like, it's getting late. It's, we got to go. It's getting late. We got to go. It's getting late. It's getting late. When it comes to reaching this community, when it comes to the times we live in, and I'm not a doomsday preacher, but we're closer today than we were yesterday, and you look around, it's getting late. It's a season of multiplication because without people meeting Jesus, they're going to spend eternity apart from him. And there's miracles in this room, and there's miracles that he wants us to be a part of. And we've got to make sure that we're ready to be a part of those miracles because it's getting late. It's getting late for families that need to be restored. It's getting late for people that are struggling with their calling. It's getting late for people that are addicted and broken. It's getting late for people that are wrestling with life or death issues. It's getting late. Pastor, what can I actually do? Something. I don't have a lot. Two little fish and, and five loaves doesn't go very far. You ever tried to share a meal from Long John Silver's? doesn't go very far. Nobody has. Nobody goes there. <laughs> this kid doesn't have a golden corral, all-you-can-eat buffet, doesn't have a trust fund, or an all-you-can-eat restaurant. He has what he has. But what you have in Jesus' hands has the ability to be a miracle. I've only got one day off. How are you using it? I've only got this one-bedroom apartment. Sounds like you need to organize a little bit and have a small group. I've only got this one skill. Well, a little bit of skill and a little bit of resource and a little bit of opportunity in your hands is all you'll ever have. But a little bit in God's hands gives him the ability to bless it, to reorganize it, to break it, and then to distribute it for his glory and for others' good. I want to close with this thought. It's like my third close, but I'm trying to be like Jesus today. What would Jesus do? He just kept preaching. And so we don't have another service, and so we're turning this into the night service right now. So I'm just getting started. So somebody get some fish and some loaves. Long John Silver's, Uber Eats, <laughs> taking this practical. Now here's the close. What's in it for me? Well, first off, if that's your, if that's your motive, you missed the whole point. <laughs> but there is something that God does for those who are a part of the miracle. The end of the story we read in John's gospel is the disciples trusted Jesus. They did what he said. 
They were a part of the miracle, but the miracle wasn't just for everybody else. It was for them as well. Twelve baskets left, twelve the number of miracles in the Bible, and practically twelve baskets for twelve disciples. They were about to be called to go back across the Sea of Galilee. It's about to be where they see Peter and Jesus walk on the water. And God was saying, I'm not just using you to distribute the miracle to everybody else. I'm also going to allow you to be in on the miracle. And I need you to know when you decide to give, when you decide to serve, when you, try, when you decide to give God access, your order, your obedience, your organization, your ownership, that you're not just investing in somebody else's miracle, you're also investing in what God wants to do in your own life as well. That after we're done working and serving and giving, we serve a God that is never lacking to give us all we need to keep going into all that he has for us. Let's get everything in order so that God can use us in this next season, that we can be like Philip and when tested to see what our part would be, that we pass that test and we get to be a part of all that God is going to do.